Uh, first of all, before we get started, I, I would like to thank the sponsors and organizers of Pirata Seattle to make this amazing talk happen. And so I'm Pranav Behel, I'm data scientist at C2FO. Uh, I'm majorly involved there to build the risk management system. And uh, this is Jonathan Stacks, he's a DevOps engineer at C2FO. So today we'll be talking about how to build robust automated forecasting system in Python and R. Before I dive into uh, the techniques that we can implement on time series data, just to give you an overview for those who don't know what time series data is. So it's a series of data points uh, indexed in chronological order. Uh, with an equal time space in between. So let's suppose if you're dealing with data, uh, daily data, then we have observation for every day. So in this, in time series, we have time or date as the independent variable and uh, the values as the dependent variable. So I have this uh, fictitious data that I use to represent how time series data actually look like. On the x-axis, I have uh, the time. On the y-axis, I have uh, amount just showing a fictitious data for the financial transactions. So the blue represents uh, the actual time series data, whereas red uh, represents uh, the forecasted value, which we can get once we build the forecasting models. So let's get started. So the goal of this talk is to demonstrate how we can make millions of robust uh, forecasts in an automated fashion. So first I'll be defining the problem and then I'll walk you through some of the pre-processing steps that we can uh, implement for time series data, which involves profiling the data, applying different kind of transformations on the time series data, and then detecting for outliers or anomalies. Once we know how to pre-process the data, I'll walk you through some of the strategies that we can apply on time series data. And the packages that we'll be using are from uh, Python and R. And then to calculate the forecast quality of the forecasting model that we'll be implementing, uh, I'll walk you through some of the evaluation metrics that we can use uh, to calculate that. And then once we have our software architecture built up, I'll be walking you through how we can uh, choose the best hardware for a given use case, or in this case, it'll be the problem statement that we are solving. So the forecasting that we do uh, on daily basis is used throughout our underwriting process. And because of the problem statement that we are trying to solve, we are biased towards the risk aversion. And on daily basis, uh, we do the prediction for more than 250,000 unique time series, or we call them as accounts. And, and the data grows at the pace of uh, around 2x every year. So the initial goal we had was to keep the runtime of complete pipeline under five hours, at the same time optimizing for the cost and keeping it under $200 per day. And uh, the aim of doing all this is to reduce the forecast error by 10% uh, compared to the current pipeline. So, and these are some of the simple formulas that we use to estimate the runtime and cost for uh, every pipeline run. So these are used to tweak some of the variables that we have. Uh, in our case, uh, right now we have uh, the number of servers as the main variable. So if we want to reduce the runtime, we can bump up the number of servers we'll be running our pipeline on. So to calculate the runtime in, oh, on numerator, we have number of unique accounts or uh, number of unique time series we'll be forecasting uh, four multiplied by the number of strategies we'll be running. Uh, multiply that by the number of transformations that we'll be applying on the time series data, and divide that by the number of servers we'll be running our complete pipeline on, multiplied by uh, the cores each server has into the mean forecasting time per unique time series. And once we have the runtime calculated, we can easily calculate the cost in which we just multiply runtime with the number of servers we are running our pipeline on, multiplied by the cost per server. So now let's see uh, what different steps can, uh, we can perform uh, to pre-process the time series data. The very first step that we can do is uh, to profile the data in which we make sure uh, that the index of the time series data is of time 
uh, of type timestamp, and then we check for the completeness of panel, by which I mean, let's suppose if you're dealing with the financial data, uh, we don't actually see transactions every day. So to fill on those days where we don't see transactions, we just fill the null values. And one of the most important thing to take care of if you're dealing with the daily data, because the frequency for daily data is 365, so just remove the leap days. And if you're dealing with the time series data, which has seasonality, so make sure before doing any kind of forecasting, your data has at least one complete season. And also, uh, make sure that you truncate any incomplete season from your data. So as you, uh, to demonstrate that, as you can see in this graph, uh, so first of all, red reflects the original time series that we had, and uh, blue reflects the profile time series. So as you can see, there's some data after 2017, if let's suppose we are dealing with the daily data, doesn't seem like that it's a complete season. So we try to get rid of that extra data. But rather than getting rid of that data from the recent history, we just get rid of the data from the past because recent observations are more useful to make future predictions. And then other step that we can uh, perform uh, under pre-processing is imputing the missing values. So one of the simplest way that we can do uh, by uh, filling the missing values is using descriptive statistics like mean or median to replace the missing values. The other uh, strategy or technique that we have is co uh, called interpolation. So if you look at the very first graph, uh, we have a disconnection in the time series which reflects the missing data. So idea behind interpolation is to take the coordinates where we see there's a disconnection in the time series and uh, apply different techniques like linear polynomial and, or cubic and then replace the missing data accordingly, as we can see in the second graph. Whereas uh, extrapolation is a technique which we use when the missing data is at the very end of the time series as opposed to what we see in the interpolation. And the strategy we can use in extrapolation is forecast a training model or forecasting model on the time series data and then make predictions for the missing values in time series. The other thing that we can do is uh, detect for outliers or anomalies. So just to give you a brief uh, how they are different. Uh, so outlier is a data point or a bunch of data point that lies farther away from a statistical mean or median of your data distribution. And some of the common ways to look for outlier is plot box plot, or uh, you can decompose the time series into different components uh, like trends, seasonality, and residuals. and work on the individual component to look for outliers. Whereas anomaly is uh, an illegitimate data point in the data uh, distribution that you have. By that I mean, let's suppose if you're dealing with the weather data, and then uh, you are looking for a weather data for a city which experienced hot summers, and you're looking at the summer data itself, and then you experience uh, or you see an observation which is pretty low, like 40 degree Fahrenheit, which looks like an anomaly. So one of the common way uh, to detect the anomaly is to divide your time series data into train data and holdout set, and then build a forecasting model on the train data and calculate the forecast error for the holdout set. And once you have the forecast error, you can compare that uh, to the threshold uh, through which you can detect if, it's a, if a data point in the time series is anomaly or not, and that threshold is again dependent on the use case or the type of data that you're dealing with. So yeah, this is one of the interesting uh, examples that I wanted to bring up. So this is a fictitious data that I'm using. So one of the ways we can detect or remove outliers is just if, if you can see in the first graph, the data looks pretty stationary. So the, so the technique we are using is like, any data point which is beyond uh, second standard deviation, we just get rid of that. That, that looks like working fine for the, in the very first graph because we have a stationary data. But if you try to imply the same thing for a data in which we have moving mean and moving standard deviation, uh, that doesn't seem like working as we expected because it seems like we are getting rid of 
uh, some of the legitimate data points here. So just uh, keep in mind if you are dealing with uh, data with trends or moving means. So this is not the uh, technique to uh, use for outlier detection. So now as we know how we can pre-process the data, let's look at some of the forecasting models or strategies, different type of strategies that we can implement on time series data. So one of the strategies uh, which is pretty common is using regression models. Uh, so in regression models we can build uh, models like OLS, polynomial, but the problem with the regression model is like if you're using just the univariate time series data, uh, trend not always follows the parametric behavior. And even if it does, you will end up with uh, residuals with high correlation. But you can use regression if you extract features out of time series, and then you can build up uh, some of the complex regression model like XGBoost. Then we have other uh, models uh, called ARMA, known as autoregressive moving averages. So ARMA and smoothing models share a lot of common characteristics. So first of all, they are based on the idea like tomorrow's prediction is based on today's data and some of the recent past data. And also, uh, they are mostly used when you're dealing with just a univariate time series. But the only difference or the major difference is some of the smoothing strategies can also be used for nonlinear data, whereas ARMA is basically used for, uh, for the situation where you're just dealing with the univariate time series. And then we have structural models, also known as state space models. So the idea behind these models or type of strategies is tomorrow's uh, prediction is basically dependent on today's state only. And the idea behind using these models is when you are dealing or when the time series data observation value is not just dependent on the time, but also some of the other factors, like in stock market, uh, there's no price over the weekend. So now we know how to uh, build different forecasting models on the time series. So let's see how we can evaluate the forecasting quality that we get out of those strategies. So there are two different types of uh, evaluation metrics. One is scale dependent, which requires that two time series models that you're comparing or two time series that you're actually comparing should be on the same scale. Like you can't use a time series uh, which has observation in kilograms and other in grams. So some of the common examples uh, for scale dependent are mean absolute error, where we take the mean of forecast error and forecast error is just uh, the difference between uh, the forecasted value and the actual value. And some other examples are mean squared error, mean forecast error, and root mean squared errors. So whereas uh, scale dependent, which is other type of evaluation metric, this is used when you have a time series, two time series that you're comparing on a different scale. So we can use scale independent just because, uh, so most of the examples for scale independent is our percentage errors. So here we care about how much, by how much percentage are we away from the actuals. So as you can see, in mean percentage error, we are dividing the forecast by the actual values and then multiplying the mean of that to the 100 to get the percentage. So uh, other example uh, is mean absolute scale error. So this is actually based on the idea to, to see your forecasting model is how far from the naive model in which today's prediction is solely dependent on what is uh, yesterday's observation value was. And now we know how to perform different steps and build forecasts. Let's see how we utilize all that information for our problem statement. So our problem statement is divided into two sub goals. One was uh, runtime optimization in which we'll try to narrow down different strategies and transformations that we can apply on the time series data. And then we have other, other uh, goal that we have is cost optimization in which we'll try to uh, use different options for the hardwares uh, to reduce the cost for each pipeline run. So let's see how we optimize for the runtime. So uh, 
this is the graph to show what was our initial approach. Our initial approach was to implement different strategies that we can on our time series data, and then also apply uh, different transformation. For now, for initially, we just uh, used log transformation, and default here reflects uh, a data without any transformation. And to measure the forecasting quality, we went ahead and used bunch of different metrics because we had no idea and we wanted to get a feel how or what kind of result they output and if they fall in consensus we might just use all of them. And then uh, once we have that we implemented all of that software part in Python version 2 as well as Python version 3. Uh, so as I said we wanted to uh, build a robust forecasting system so we wanted to see which Python version is performing the best for our use case. And then once we have the software part figured out, we'll see which hardware instance or a type is best for our problem state. So the very first experiment that we performed, or before I get into the experiment, so we used 1,000 different unique time series or 1,000 accounts. Uh, so and those thousands of uh, accounts or unique time series reflect the diversity of the data that we deal with on a daily basis. So we, we did all the experiment on those thousand accounts. And yeah, so the first experiment was uh, to get the feel of metrics and see if all of the metrics fall in consensus. And so if so, then use all of it. Otherwise, try to get rid of some of the metrics which are throwing away redundant information or if they have any kind of conflicts. So let's see. Okay, before you get overwhelmed with this uh, graph, let me explain you what this graph is used for. Uh, so this graph is uh, to compare all the different strategies that I mentioned in last slide. Uh, so we are running uh, all the different trans uh, strategies with the different transformations, and we are comparing uh, their results across different metrics, uh, which, are, which are labeled on the x-axis. On the y-axis, I have the number of win counts or number of accounts for which a particular uh, strategy and transformation combination won. So if you look at, uh, so also uh, there's a, there's a continuous line and a dotted line with the same color. So continuous line reflects a strategy built on the default data, which is non-transformed data, and dotted reflects uh, the same strategy built on the log-transformed data. So just to give you an example, if you look at uh, the dotted line, the orange dotted line under MPE, which is the very first metric, uh, the count uh, seems to be around 125. So what it says is like out of all 1,000 accounts, uh, we experimented. Uh, so that dotted orange reflects P log autorima. So Python autorima ran with the log transformation. So that is winning 125 times out of 1,000 unique time series that we experimented. So uh, in this graph, I try to bunch all the different metrics which have same characteristic uh, together. So if you see on the left, so left to the MASE, which is kind of in the middle, is uh, the scale uh, independent metrics, and everything towards the right of MASE is scale dependent metrics. So if you look closely, there's a huge conflict between uh, the percentage error metrics, which are first three, compared to any other metrics that we have. And this calls out for the situation where we should not be using uh, percentage errors, which was our problem statement. So in our problem statement, in our actuals or test data or holdout set, we had zeros. And if you remember, in percentage error, we divide forecast error by the actual values. So if you divide something by zero, it'll just give you error. But to, uh, to, to just get rid of that, we added a small constant but that still didn't uh, seem to be solving the problem. So we thought of getting rid of all the percentage errors uh, because either ways we are dealing with all the time series on the same scale. And then the other thing that we looked for, uh, if you look at uh, MSC, RMSC, and SSC towards the right side, uh, so we can see they are showing some of the redundant results. So we 
thought of keeping just one metric and getting rid of other two. So similarly, we went ahead and got rid of anything which is marked in the red block. Uh, so ultimately, we were left with uh, MFE, RMSC, SMAP, and MACE. So now we know what metrics are useful for us. So let's see uh, what else we can do for optimizing the time. So the next experiment that we ran was to get a feel how our uh, different strategies are performing. So let's see how they are performing. And, and one, one more thing that we wanted to look in this experiment was to try different parameter values for different strategies that we are implementing. But initially, we started off with the default parameters, except for PyFlux, one of the strategies that we are using. We, we used a uh, reduced number of simulations for that. So again, uh, this is kind of the graph that we had in last experiment. On the x-axis, I have metric. On the y, I have number of win counts. So the purple one, which is at the very top, reflects our autorima with default transformation, which means no transformation. Uh, that is winning over, uh, or that is winning followed by TBATS, followed by Python autorima, followed by profit. So those are, uh, those seems to be performing really good uh, for our unique time series that we have. But then if we look at the very bottom, so every color or every line associated with PyFlux seem to be lying at the very bottom, which means PyFlux is not actually performing good for our use case or our problem statement. So analyzing that, we thought of getting rid of PyFlux from our strategies. And just because, uh, so the most time consuming thing in this whole architecture is strategies. So we wanted to see if we can uh, do something more to get or reduce the time. So I forgot to mention one thing earlier. So PyArima is nothing but uh, the implementation of our AutoArima in Python. So this is a homegrown uh, algorithm. So we wrote it according to our uh, problem statement. So, so, the, so the idea is, uh, because if you remember the last graph, our AutoArima was performing the best out of all the strategies. So the idea here is to get rid of Python implementation of R's auto rima if the difference between uh, the forecast of Python auto rima and R auto rima is not too much. So we looked at the, the cases where only Python auto rima was winning, and we wanted to see at the and we wanted to see how R auto rima is far away from Python auto rima forecasts. So we went ahead and looked at the median of differences. So, and we, we calculated differences amongst all the different metrics, but here I'm just showing MFE and RMSE. And so the values that you can see here for MFE for the default transformation or no transformation was 1367. Similarly for log transformation was 13, 37, 31. For our use case, it was under our expected limit. So we went ahead and got rid of Python Autorima. Now we have our strategies figured out. Uh, so we went on to transformations and added, uh, like researched a bit and added one more transformation, which was Boxcox transformation. And then uh, the another experiment that we performed was to figure out which Python version is performing the best for our use case. And to do that, what we did was like we ran combination of all strategies, transformation, and different hardware we want to experiment. And there were a total of 45 combinations we came up with. We, wa we wanted to compare the timing of Python version 2 to the Python version 3. I know it's a bit confusing, this graph. The only thing that we have to care about is uh, the red reflects uh, the Python version 2 processing time, whereas uh, blue reflects the Python version 3 processing time. And in most of the cases, if you just overlook, we can see uh, red is the, the, the value for red is higher, which reflects Python version 2 is taking more time compared to Python version 3. And to summarize this graph, I compared the timings against different calculation types 
One was pre-processing, how it is performing, how different versions are performing uh, for pre-processing and then modeling, which was the main part. And then at the last, uh, comparing the cumulative times. So as we can see, Python version 3 seems to be a clear winner here. So we went ahead and got rid of Python 2 and declared Python 3 as our version for new pipeline. And now let's see uh, how we can decide what hardware works the best for us. We already ran uh, all the different combinations, and we already had the timing for all of them. So we just compared uh, the timing across different uh, different har hardware types that we wanna, want our uh, pipeline to be running on, or different hardwares that were available. And we compared the time, as we can see, uh, so the very first here is C48 type, so which is a compute optimized uh, hardware instance so, and that makes sense because uh, we are doing a lot of uh, modeling which is compute heavy. So C48 seems to be a clear winner here. So we went ahead and got rid of uh, other hardware types and we decided to run our pipeline on the compute optimized system. And then we had everything figured out except that we just wanted to uh, optimize some of our runtime more if we can, then we had two questions. One was, is there any strategy which is taking longer time compared to other strategies? And also, to run some of the R code, uh, we are using RPy2. So is that creating any kind of an overhead in R code? And we can just replace that with something more optimized. So for the very first, yeah, we compared uh, the timing for all the different models that we are running. So the three uh, bars that you can see in the center reflects the R uh, auto Rima strategy running on diff three different transformations. And we can see uh, R auto Rima is taking comparatively very high time compared to other strategies. So we went ahead and looked closely at the stats. So uh, just forget about auto Rima for a minute and look at TBATS and profit. So we can see the mean forecasting time for TBATS, all the timings are in seconds, uh, is just five seconds. For profit, the mean is around just three seconds. And the max for TBATS is 31 and profit is just five seconds. But now if we look at auto Rima, the mean is 33 seconds, which is pretty high compared to other two models. And also, if you look at mean and then look at the 75th percentile, which is 24 seconds, whereas mean is 33 seconds, which signifies there's something going wrong or there are some accounts which are taking really uh, huge amount of time to process. And even if you look at the max, uh, one of the account was taking 1,600 seconds, which is a little lesser than half an hour. So then we looked at uh, the distribution of the data under second standard deviation. And we see, uh, just for the auto Rima, if you look at, uh, the mean uh, became half of what we had for all the samples. It is 19 seconds now, and the max is just 232 seconds. Looking at this, uh, we, uh, we came to a position where we thought we'll uh, be implying a time threshold of five minutes, which is 300 seconds, and we'll just time out anything which is taking more than five minutes. And before we would have went ahead doing that, we thought of uh, analyzing how much forecasting strength will we be losing if we do that. So out of all the 1,000 accounts, there were 26 accounts or 26 unique time series uh, which would have timed out in case of auto Rima. But out of those 26, there are only 14 unique time series or accounts uh, which have our auto Rima as the winning strategy. And as we can see, this graph reflects how, how many times out of those 26 with strategies meaning how much. So our auto Rima with no transformation is winning the most with a seven count. So then the idea was to look at uh, the difference distribution, uh, which by which I mean, uh, let's suppose for an account, our auto Rima or profit is the winning uh, strategy, compare that 
to what is the next winning strategy? What is the difference between them? So we plotted that uh, on the left-hand side, as you can see, and compared that to the MFE, or we just keeping evaluation metric as uh, MFE here. So we compared the different distribution for the cases where our, our autorima was exceeding 300 seconds, but was winning for those accounts. So if you remember, there were seven accounts for our autorima uh, with no transformation. So I'm just looking for, just for the visualization purpose here. I'm just showing only that case. Uh, so as we can see, for more than half of uh, the accounts, which is four accounts, the difference is pretty low, though we have some of the outliers. So based on that, we thought of moving ahead and implementing 300 seconds or five minutes as our time threshold. So this helped us to gain 10% of speed up uh, with a maintainable, uh, acceptable loss that we can have in forecasting strength. And then we, uh, the other problem that I mentioned we had was uh, RPI2 that could have caused overhead, but before we could have went ahead and analyzed how much overhead RPI2 is causing, uh, we went to an, into a problem uh, when we were applying for the time threshold. Uh, RPI2 was not efficient to apply time threshold. It was not able to uh, time out at a given time. So, so the only solution or the solution that we uh, came up with after uh, to, to get rid of RPI2 was to build individual scripts for all the R codes and call them from uh, Python subprocess. And then after that, uh, we figured one more uh, strategy out, which was Bayesian structural time series. It's kind of a state space model. We wanted to add that, and before adding that, we again experimented and, how, and see how it was performing. So yellow line reflects uh, the R Bayesian structural time series, and it was performing uh, considerably good especially if we compare that to PyFlux, which we saw was performing very poorly for our use case. So then we went ahead and kept BSTS uh, as one of our strategy. And this is what became our concluding pipeline. And then second part is uh, optimizing for the scale and cost, which will be covered uh, by Jonathan Stacks. Thank you, Pranav. Um, I'm going to talk real briefly on uh, scale, and cop op scale and cost optimization. So now that we had um, our forecast and what we were going to run, we needed a way to scale it up. So uh, the first thing we looked at using is Docker. Um, we'd already been using this uh, pretty widely at C2FO. Um, there's a lot of tools around deploying it and that we had a deployment system um, already tailored around this. So um, from a show of hands, how many people have heard of or used Docker? Okay, great. Um, I think for um, the scientific Python community, it could be a great fit. Um, if you're using Conda, it's really easy to install your Conda environment into a Docker image. Um, the other benefit of this is when you go to deploy across the cluster, you don't have to rebuild um, on every single machine. You can take that um, immutable image and you can just directly drop it on and then spin up uh, as many containers as you need. Um, and then one final point, you can run the same code in production that you do on your local machine, so developers can develop and there's no more throwing it over the wall and saying, well, it worked on my machine. Uh, I don't know why it's not working in production. So this is the basic architecture um, of our pipeline. Uh, the piece that we were breaking out uh, and optimizing was this piece right here where we're using um, Celery to spin up a bunch of uh, Docker workers uh, on ECS. We're pulling data out of Redshift um, into a temporary uh, database, and then all these workers are consuming it, doing the forecast, and then um, we're writing results up to S3. And then um, those are going, uh, like I said, it's Apache Parquet. Um, and like we mentioned earlier, we're running Docker on the C4-8X large instances, and our main pipeline is in Luigi. So this is a, a better look at the concurrency implementation. So initially, we um, prime our database with uh, data that we pull out of Redshift. It's not really efficient to keep hitting it with lots of workers where you're running lots of forecast. So we do that initial load once. And then um, in ECS, we spin up 1,000 workers uh, right now that are all processing data. 
Um, we're using Celery, so we load the messages onto the queue. Each worker picks up a message, says, hey, I'm supposed to process this account, goes to the database, gets the data, starts churning it, and then writes the forecast up to S3. And then um, we're using uh, Redis as a uh, backend for Celery, so it's writing all the task info and state there so we can monitor them with Flower, if anyone's ever heard of that, or Flower, I think some people pronounce it. So this is the, the basic implementation that we have. Um, some stats that we have, we're running this across uh, 28 instances, since each one is 36 cores, that gives us uh, 1,008 uh, cores when we run 1,000 workers. We do about 2.6 million forecasts um, in around 5.5 hours. Uh, the 0.5 hours is mainly for cluster spin up time. Um, the whole pipeline runs in about five hours though. Um, one thing that I really wanted to drive home here was if you have the opportunity to use spot instances, um, it requires a little bit more configuration on your part um, in the fact that you don't know when that instance is going to go away. So you need to make sure that you're writing um, robust infrastructure and code. But the cost is uh, quite um, a reduction. So the thing is too is that you can lose them at any time because it's based on a bidding model. So if a lot of people want to run spot instances, the price goes up. Um, so you just have to be aware of that. But the cost per run um, is about, I think, 40%. Um, so if you can, and uh, you can write your architecture around that, I would say use spot instances. So, so in conclusion, um, implementing all of this uh, resulted in a reduction of forecasting error. Um, as you can see, this is on log scale, but we've shifted down um, the percent difference. So uh, Pranav, do you want to come back up? Hello. So, uh, yeah, some of the future improvements that we are thinking of is uh, running the experiment on schedule basis so that if any of the libraries uh, gets upgrades, we can look for that because one of the significant changes that we figured out was in the case of FB Profit, uh, they upgraded their uh, library and there was a significant change in the results. and. Uh, then add some of the regression models or uh, the XG boost that I was talking. So we are working on that to extract the feature from time series and add some of the regression models. And then investigate if we can, uh, if we can move from Amazon to Google and if that performs better. We were also looking at um, AWS Batch there. Um, that would really help decouple us from our uh, data science team and allow them to kind of self-service their own jobs. Um, in addition, AWS Batch also will spin up and down um, workloads, uh, resulting in cost savings as well. So that was an exciting new product that we want to look into. So these are some of the references that you can look for if you want to know some of the more details about the forecasting, pre-processing, or even to know more about C2FO. So any questions? So uh, Parquet is something that... Just make sure to repeat the question. Okay, so uh, uh, the question was, why are we using Parquet? So Parquet is actually something that we are thinking of using down the line, so that uh, rather than extracting all the data into a temporary SQL for which we pay, or database for which we pay, if we can uh, get all of the data in a flattened file, and it will be more accessible. Any other questions? I've got one. Okay. Um, so I'm curious, uh, you talked about sort of, you know, clearly there was like this, this part at the beginning where you're like, you know, kind of splashing around and like trying this out. And then like, you know, at the end you have this like clean, like we've got Docker, we've got, you know, everything running, we can deploy it on EC2. Mm -hmm. Like a common thing that I see people spend a lot of time beating their head against is sort of like, what are the smooth paths or the things that work particularly well or poorly from like, you have some people basically just wanting to write a little bit of Python or R to like, DevOps has something in their hands and there's a smooth path to deploying that. Like, you know, are there any other thoughts or you know, lessons learned that you might want to offer from that part of the story? I'll take the first part. Um, the, from our talk, it kind of seemed like a handoff in the middle, but we were definitely involved um, early on. We were working through the same instance types um, and running forecast all the time. 
um, early on to even run our forecast in an automated way and um, allow Pranav to do these different experiments, we actually automated that. So he could go in and he would push um, up a branch of code that, you know, maybe tweak something and then he could go through an automated deployment system. He could just hit deploy and then the results were posted up in S3. He could pull them down, analyze them um, from any number of instances. So yeah. that was kind of um, something that we worked on continuously. And I would say it definitely uh, behooves anyone to involve uh, DevOps or even like infrastructure ops teams earlier than later um, because so they can work with you and they can know what's going on. I think that that helps. Yeah. So. Okay. All right, let me, sorry, my phone call mid <laughs> question check was poorly timed. ran all of your experiments, it seemed like you still had four like candidate models mm -hmm. left. Um, what what does that look like in practice? Like when you get something that you need to forecast, do you pick one of them? Like, yeah, so uh, the question is like if you're running different strategies, how you're picking up the models, right? Or sorry, I thought you were trying to distill it down into one final model that no. So the thing is, uh, what we figured out why we are using different strategies, because there are some properties different amongst all the different strategies. And, and all of the time series data that we have doesn't reflect the same characteristics. So in some cases, we have uh, a lot of uh, like days where we don't see any transactions. So there are some of models that picks up that thing very well. Whereas there are some models which picks up the heavy data very well, where we have uh, the transactions throughout our uh, time span. So there are different time of, uh, times of time, se uh, time series that we are dealing with. And just because of that, there are different characteristics each strategy have, and they pick on that. So we, we run them all, and then we choose the best one at the end. Yeah. yeah. So that's why we're running so many forecasts. Yeah, so uh, as I uh, mentioned, so uh, different evaluation metrics that we are using. So finally, we came, uh, right now we are working on having a meta metric, and we have co uh, combined uh, MFE and RMSE together. So combined uh, sum, so any uh, strategy which has lower combined sum wins for a particular unique time series or an account. Thank you. Sorry, I yep. think I'm misunderstanding. Why do you use multiple so uh, initially, the idea was uh, to use different evaluation metrics if they are in consensus and keep all of them and try to build up a meta metrics, which we can use uh, to compare different strategies and pick up the best model using that. Yeah. All right. I think we're good. So let's thank our speakers again.